So welcome back. I hope you all got uh, um, have your coffee, your tea, a little biscuit to join us for the um, last but not least session of this um, meeting. And we continue with uh, Chiara from the Natural History Museum. And yeah, it's all yours. Thank you. I hope you can see my screen. I cannot see anybody, but uh, I hope um, that you can see and hear me. So, um, well, let's talk about the uh, a non isothermal approach to mag magma dynamics. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, an outline and why uh, we need to move from isothermal to non isothermal modeling. Um, then uh, I will show you. Um, a bit about the non-isothermal step model approach and talk about some uncertainties and how these can improve our understanding of magma dynamics. Um, Dan has set the scene uh, for me quite nicely, so thank you, Dan. Um, and uh, what we know that is the diffusive chronometer starts upon the formation of a chemical gradient. Uh, it's strongly controlled by the temperature. And uh, the other thing that is important is that um, as Sumi said yesterday, it's ubiquitous, uh, it's always there. So the diffusion doesn't stop upon uh, when the compositional boundary has been isolated from melt by the overgrowth of the further external crystal portion. Um, as we have heard uh, yesterday and uh, today from Claire and from uh, Dan, uh, it's quite important to know uh, which process are we targeting. So this is a, a, a compilation from a, a, of time scale from magma mixing to eruption from a recent paper of Costa uh, et al. Uh, for different volcano, uh, different setting and uh, composition, the blue one are the basalt and the red one are the uh, um, more silicic, dacitic, uh, rhyolitic. Um, clearly what we see here, it, it's, uh, quite well known is that the CDC system, uh, they tend to have longer time scale than the uh, MAFIC system. But uh, the point that I would like to make uh, with this one is that um, really depends on what we are looking at. So if we look at the, uh, in this case, the mixing to eruption uh, time scale, we generally assume that this, the uh, last stage of mixing and crystallization takes place uh, in the shallow reservoir uh, prior uh, the eruption. Um, so the time scale that we are looking at, they capture this last uh, portion of event of, a, 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 of the magmatic system. Most of the time, this is uh, good enough uh, since uh, we are more interested in the, what is happening in the final stage uh, of a magmatic system. But uh, we know that uh, crystal, they record a longer uh, history, uh, a more complex history. Uh, on the top, we have an orthopyroxene from uh, uh, Popocatépetl in Mexico, from a recent paper of, uh, that we, of Martin Mangler. Um, and on the bottom, a clinoparoxine uh, from Stromboli. What we can see uh, is a, a profile from the internal portion from the core to the rim where we have a low magnesium um, portion, then high magnesium band clearly testifying the injection of the mafic magma, and then again the low magnesium rim. For the clinoparoxine here from Stromoli, we have a complex, more complex history uh, with a sieved uh, core surrounded by a mafic uh, portion here, and then a, a low magnesium portion, and again, again in another uh, injection of mafic magma until the eruption here at the rim. And if we can, um, if we know the temperature of this uh, injection of mafic magma and the low magnesium magma, we can see that the temperature between these two magma is quite different. And we know that this will affect the uh, diffusion. Um, as Dan said, uh, really depends. Uh, I mean, it's quite important to see the scale that uh, we're looking at. So if we want to reconstruct just the history of a crystal, of a crystal population, because uh, as we know, if we look at the crystal population uh, in a single rock, uh, we found uh, things quite complex. Um, 
These are uh, some orthoperoxine from um, Popo Caterpert. Uh, and uh, Martin um, recognized three different uh, population. The first one, this uh, with a yellow core, which is a low magnesium uh, population, surrounded by a, the, a more mafic core here. And the second population has uh, a mafic core here in green, surrounded by a, a low magnesium core. And then we have a third population that's something in between. Clearly, I mean, this uh, tell us a, a history of the plumbing system with the uh, mafic population uh, starting um, crystallizing in a mafic melt, and uh, which has this uh, sort of temperature and pressure. And then uh, the, um, uh, the evolved uh, population that start to crystallize in this environment in a shallow uh, uh, evolved melt, which has completely different temperature um, and then there, there are quite a lot of mixing and hybridization processes between the two. Um, and so the, the main problem is that clearly magmatic processes are not non-isothermal, but at this point, is the assumption of a single temperature good enough? Well, yes and no. If we would just to look at the, what is happening in this system as the last bit of the, uh, before the, the uh, eruption, maybe yes. But if we would like to uh, have a, a better constraint on the magmatic history, probably not. We have to move from the uh, non, to, from isothermal to non isothermal modeling. Uh, and this has been done uh, by uh, several people. I think this is the paper that uh, from Mar and Carl. Um, I think this was one of the first paper um, uh, looking at the, uh, trying to incorporate the non isothermal and doing the modeling at different temperature uh, for Etna volcano. Um, so looking at the um, uh, Olivine uh, zonation pattern from rim to rim, uh, what Maren found was that uh, she can model this profile in different steps um, and reconstruct, uh, reconducted these to different magmatic environments, something similar that uh, Dan has shown. Um, uh, reconstructed the uh, crystallization, the um, mixing profile um, and the zoning pattern of olivine in this different magmatic environment correlated to the magma plumbing system at Etna. Um, and she was able to uh, not only reconstruct the uh, the movement and the uh, zonation uh, pattern, but also giving a time scale uh, of storage in each of these magmatic environment. Um, Another example of uh, a non-isothermal approach is that uh, from uh, Druid et al. Uh, in 2012 on Santorini, um, uh, where they modeled uh, the uh, chemical composition, the chemical profile of a, a plagioclase, uh, characterized by complex zoning with an uh, high calcium uh, inner core, the, um, surrounded by the acidic uh, core and then finally by rhyodacetic melt. Uh, what is shown here is, uh, uh, which is the, the two different approach. I mean, uh, what we get if we use a single step model, so using one single temper to, re uh, to uh, model the entire diffusion profile uh, from core to rim. This is the magnesium uh, profile, and the red one is the model, uh, uh, the, the fitting model. Uh, clearly, what uh, they got is a, a time scale, uh, but the fitting is really uh, not, uh, not really uh, good. Um, so it's an almost fit, uh, as uh, Dan uh, was telling us before. But then they improved the model and they pressed the um, model at this the diffusion between the inner core and the acidic melt at the uh, temperature of the acidic melt. And then uh, once they're informed, the diffusion with the radioacetic melt at the temperature of the radioacetic melt. And clearly, the fitting of the model is much better in this case. And also, they were able to calculate two different uh, time scales, partial time scale, the storage in the acetic melt, and then remobilization from the, uh, from the radioacetic melt 
uh, uh, up to the eruption. Uh, starting from this, uh, the last few years, um, uh, we have uh, proposed a multi-step uh, uh, model uh, in order to, uh, uh, to model complex uh, zone uh, crystal to resolve the time scale uh, in complex zone crystal, uh, trying to resolve the chronostratigraphy of a crystal uh, as much as possible. Um, so this is similar to what we have seen for uh, um, the plagio glaze for uh, Santorini. In this case, we have a clinoparoxy uh, where we have a low magnesium uh, core surrounded by high magnesium band and then a, a low magnesium uh, rim. So this is the red one is the profile in grayscale value. So the high magnesium, the low magnesium will be high gray, the gray value and the low magnesium is the low gray value. Using a backward approach, starting from the rim uh, to, to the core, we deconstructed the entire core rim profile uh, in a single isothermal step, each one using the uh, proper diffusion coefficient calculated at the right temperature of the magma. So for example, in this case, uh, first we modeled the uh, band rim profile, modeled at the, te uh, the temperature of the low magnesium magma, and we um, were able to calculate a partial time scale called the year delta T2. Then moving backward, uh, we start to model the core band diffusion profile. And uh, the assumption is that uh, this portion has diffused for the same time, for this, this same delta T2 time, uh, up to, so we were able to reconstruct this uh, sort of uh, second initial profile, the, uh, dashed blue line. And starting from this, uh, we then model the uh, diffusion at the time, at the temperature of the high magnesium uh, magma. And finally, we got the, a, a, the, time, the time scale of the uh, diffusion of this portion at the high temperature uh, of the high magnesium magma. And we call it this delta T2. So, uh, also, we got the, these two partial time scale. The final time scale uh, for, from the magma mixing to eruption will be the sum of these two partial time scales, the delta T1 and delta T2. Um, in terms of the modeling in itself, uh, we use it, um, this, the simple equation, this uh, 1D uh, um, equation from Morgan et al, uh, using the back, back uh, scattering gray value use it as a proxy of uh, the magnesium uh, number um, on the basis that the grayscale value and the uh, compositional profile, they have a, a completely similar, a very similar uh, fitting parameter, the square root of 4DT. Uh, we calculate the gray value uh, along this uh, blue uh, area, blue re rectangle, um, using a MATLAB code and all the fitting is, is done using a MATLAB code that is pretty, available on GTR. Um, so what, what sort of uh, time scale we can get? Well, uh, clearly we can resolve the time scale from magma mixing to eruption uh, with these two, uh, the total time scale, but also the two partial time scale, the delta T1, delta T2, so time scale of crystal storage in different magmatic environments. Uh, in this particular case from Stromboli, uh, we have a delta T1, which is much shorter than delta T2, which tell us something about the efficiency of mixing, as I will show you uh, later on. Uh, we were also able to resolve more complex crystal uh, in the top um, crystal uh, clinoparoxine, we have three different magmatic injection and we were able to uh, um, get the uh, resolve the time scale and the storage and the arrival of each of these ma uh, magmatic injection. Uh, in the bottom uh, crystal, we have the um, a complex core and, and sieved core, uh, which tell us about the mass remobilization and eruption. So if we move to uncertainty, uh, we all know that the diffusion, uh, there are a lot of uncertainty, which I listed here, and I'm not going in, into that. Uh, we have heard uh, about this yesterday um, and today. Um, I want to uh, point out the error um, related to the main, the, to, to the, um, 
bigger uh, controller of the uncertainty temperature and D. So let's start with the, temp uh, the, uh, the type of uh, error that we use uh, that calculated for the NIDIS model. Um, we use uh, the narrow propagation uh, with a fit function uh, that takes into account the error on the temperature uh, which also affect the uh, diffusion coefficient and the error on the uh, fitting parameter, the square root of uh, dt. Um, and the, uh, considering an error on the temperature between 10 and 15 degrees, we have an uncertainty of about maximum of 40% uh, uh, 1 SD in the total residence time estimated. But uh, how about the... Uh, so uh, if we have an error on temperature higher than 10, 15 degrees, uh, well, the error, then the error on the uh, time scale is much higher. So um, in this recent paper that um, I've been doing, uh, this work with I've been doing with Silvio Moll and Pier Giorgio Scarlato, we uh, calculated the, uh, calibrated a thermometer specific for Stromboli, for the present day activity of Stromboli. Uh, and in this particular case, the thermometer is as, as good as plus or minus six degree. Um, and um, this, using this error on our model, we could decrease the error to 20%. Whereas if we use uh, a, the, the normal, uh, a normal error, like the global thermometer here with an error of plus or minus 24 degree, the error is, is as big as 70%. So we can see that the temperature really plays a big role uh, in decreasing the temperature. Um, going back to the to the needies, uh recently uh, Ruth uh, et al, so the group of uh, Gerard Warner, they uh, uh, using the NIDIS model, they proposed a very uh, um, interesting um, uh, simple geometrical relationship, um, which allowed to calculate the uh, diffusive boundary for, uh, for each uh, isothermal step, simply using the curve fit, the DT, as a, a sum of, of each uh, curve parameter um, that precedes the, the diffusion boundary that we would like to uh, model. Using these uh, simple geometrical relationships, uh, this means that actually the uncertainty uh, on the temperature is only accounted one, contributed only once, and this decreased the error, uh, reduced the error on the um, time scale quite significantly uh, down even at 10%. How about the D? So uh, in this case, I just would like to um, make a, a just a, a word of caution in the in the D in the diffusion uh, parameter, because clearly the D is calculated uh, is uh, obtained by uh, experiment, experiments, and there is a uh, there are error associated with the uh, pre exponential factor the D zero and with the activation energy the E. Um, and there is, I mean, this needs to be taken into account and they clearly have an impact on, on uh, our, um, on the error on the time scale. But one important thing is that each of these experiments is run in, in particular condition and um, this condition, not, they, they might not uh, really apply to the, uh, they might not be uh, reflect the um, condition of our uh, magmatic system. Uh, in this graph, there are two um, uh, diffusion coefficients from two different paper for the iron magnesium diffusion in orthopyroxene, the paper for, from Svant et al. in 1998, and the recent paper of Dominant et al. 2006. Um, the pyroxene uh, is an anisotropic with the C axis, uh, which is as, uh, uh, diffused faster than the, the, uh, the along the A axis. And this is uh, all good. All the paper, all the, the, the these two papers, they, they found this uh, relationship with no problem. But when we try to um, export the experiment that the uh, spant uh, diffusion coefficient to the condition of popo, we found uh, uh, we run in, into a problem because the uh, spun uh, 
uh, experiments were run in this range of temperature and Popo uh, has this much higher temperature. So at this condition, this uh, SPAND model um, give us a faster diffusion along the A acid a axis uh, and there's lower diffusion along the C axis, which clearly is untrue. Um, so um, clearly, I mean, we really need to uh, be careful when we try to uh, extrapolate the diffusion coefficient to um, outside the experimental condition. So uh, I just would like to show you some uh, um, implication on the magma dynamics um, and particularly the, the work, the recent work that we have been doing uh, at uh, Stromboli. Uh, these are the uh, clinoperoxine and the different texture of clinoperoxine that we found uh, at Stromboli. In particular, in this case, we were focusing on the uh, eruptive period between 1.7 and 1 1.5 uh, kilo years, which is the uh, activity preceding the present day. Uh, the present day. So what we have here, we have some crystal that they show uh, a single uh, mafic band, so just a single um, magmatic injection or mafic injection, or, or they can record multiple injection, or they do have patchy core, uh, a more complex history, um, telling us that they, they clearly are remobilization of, of the marsh, or uh, they can have, uh, they can record it a mafic input just at the rim, uh, which probably it allows something about the triggering of the eruption. We calculate the time scale for all these uh, crystals, uh, three different uh, uh, samples, um, and there is no surprise that we got all sorts of time scale as expected from uh, quite a long time scale, 100 year up to a very short time scale, few years. But it's more interesting when we are going to look at the granularity of this data and we are looking at the DT, Delta T1 and Delta T2. So here the Delta T1 uh, is reported in yellow. Um, so this is the time scale uh, against the different crystal here uh, on the uh, y-axis. So the D delta T1, which is uh, the uh, time spent uh, in contact uh, in the, melt the high temperature, high magnesium melt, do melt domain, um, is clearly recording very short time scale. It's much shorter than the blue symbol, which recorded the delta T2 time scale. So the time spent in the uh, low temperature, low magnesium magmatic environment prior the eruption. And what is delta T2 much shorter than delta T, uh, delta T1 much shorter than the delta T2 tell us is that um, we have a very rapid mixing dynamic. The uh, mafic magma rife gets mixed very, very rapidly. And then the crystal spends some a bit longer time uh, in the low magnesium, uh, uh, low temperature domain before the eruption. Uh, quite interesting are these, the orangey guys here, uh, which they, they record the uh, mafic rim, uh, the, the time scale of the mafic rim, which tell us something about the triggering of the eruption. And we can see that they, they range from few days up to six months. So we put this all together in some kind of uh, more uh, organic view of the different texture of the crystal. Um, and uh, yes, so we were able to uh, unravel the uh, velocity of the dynamic of the mixing, magma mixing, uh, at Stromboli, which ranged from few days up to a uh, few years. Then we were able to uh, time scale or give a constraint from the time from mixing to eruption in the months to 150 years. Um, also to constrain the remobilization from the crystal mash uh, from one year up to 50 years the eruption triggering few hours to few months, but also uh, in some particular cases, uh, we are able to constrain the ongoing mixing. So the incoming magma uh, started to mix, but then the eruption occurred before the mixing was complete. Uh, just a follow up on this one. So this is the, uh, 
what I show you is the activity between 1.7 and 1.5 kilo here. Um, and here is what we think about the magma dynamics. So the, the uh, mafic magma arrives and moves quite rapidly uh, in the crystal mash. So there is quite a, a, a clear pathway um, in the, in the mag magmatic system in this stage. But when we look at the, the uh, more recent activity, 2003, 2017, uh, shown here, we found a completely different picture. Uh, we had a lot of recycled antiquities, so a lot of recycled from the crystal uh, mash. And um, what we found is that there is a more efficient, uh, um, a, le a less open magma pathway. So the magma has to find uh, its way up to destroying it uh, through much disruption and cannibalization before uh, arriving uh, and getting uh, before erupting. So what we could see comparing the time scale for two different periods, and here is the point of done that we really need to look at the long term and the, to have a, a better constraint on what the uh, volcano is doing um, over a long uh, period. We could see how the uh, mafic uh, the plumbing system evolve and change with time um, and this has quite a lot of implication for the magma dynamics and for uh, if we want really to to be able to help and give some um, further information uh, in terms of uh, volcanic hazard um, here are some just uh, further reading in addition to the one that uh, I mentioned. Uh, and yes, I mean, uh, I, I will pass this uh, later. And thank you very much. I'm happy to take any question. Stop sharing. Thank you, Chiara. If I manage to, seems I cannot. Uh... I think it's on the, uh, okay. on the upper. Yeah, you got it. Yes. <laughs> so are there any questions? Okay, uh, Tinker, do you want to ask the question yourself or shall I read it out? <laughs> I can say it myself. <laughs> um, so, um, yes, very interesting. You quickly mentioned that you observed an inverted diffusional um, dependence on direction, crystallographic direction, um, from experiment to your natural samples. Can you, what happened there? Uh, I, well, yeah, uh, we don't really know actually what happened in, uh, because what we did, we first started to use the Schwandt uh, diffusion for the orthopyroxene um, before uh, the, the domain one. And actually there was something strange. And then uh, we realized there was something wrong with the diffusion coefficient somehow. Uh, so Martin, uh, start to look at the diffusion and uh, compare with the domain uh, equation and the domain. And then when he started to really look at the extrapolating the Schwand to the, uh, the magmatic condition, the temperature that we were using, he noticed that there was like a really an inversion. So the, um, the, the uh, diffusion along the A axis was much faster than along the C axis, which was not the case at the experimental condition of Schwann. Uh, and we think this is just because, I mean, we tried to extrapolate it too far. Um, but yeah, I'm not an experimentalist, so I don't really know. Probably you can tell me better if this is the case or is we did something. There, uh, I would rather think of a mix up in, in crystallographic data or some yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know i, I want to think that there are different behaviors but yeah no yeah was was no. very very strange and we had no problem with the domain one which seems like fit perfectly so okay thank you Okay, we have a question from Gareth, who's interested whether you see differences in the timescales between the regular Strombolian eruptions and the paroxysmal uh, eruptions. Okay, so yeah, that's it's a very interesting question. Um, so, yes and no. Um, 
yes, in the sense that uh, there were some, uh, okay. I've been looking at the 2019 uh, paroxysmical eruption and what we have, we have very, very short time scale. So I haven't shown today because this is still work in progress. So that's the yes part. Um, no, because when we look at the first paroxysm at Stromboli, one of the first uh, early paroxysm in the uh, at Stromboli, we found the, the very similar time scale. Um, so what I think is happening at Stromboli right now is that, as I shown, the system is really changing, uh, has changed quite dramatically in the last few years, and particularly from 2003, 2017, we had all this. Uh, Antichrist and a lot of mass remobilization, mass the cannibalization. Actually, I think that the uh, this kind of cleared the path for the new paroxysm, and now we see quite a, a very, a very uh, rapid and a very uh, open pathway with magma coming in. And if it's uh, um, fast enough, or there, there is quite a lot of uh, gas, is able to give this paroxysm. So. Um, I think the system has changed again, which is quite interesting because we can actually uh, follow the changing of the uh, system just looking, well, just, I mean, after we know all the system very well. But now at this point, looking at the time scale, we can really, really follow what is happening in the system yeah, in the deeper portion. Thanks a lot for this one. Then we have a question from Schumit who's interested whether you can explain a little bit more in detail how you got the temperatures of the different zones uh, getting extracted from melts, from the program melts. Um, so um, uh, the one that actually then reduces significantly the uh, um, uncertainty on the uh, time scale, so the plus or minus six degree on Stromboli, that was uh, a new thermometer that uh, uh, Silvio Mollo has calibrated using all the uh, a compilation of data for the present day activity of Stromboli using her rock and uh, so uh, equilibrating all the uh, data that we have, or many of the data that we have on the uh, pyroxene and melt using both the glass and, and whole rock composition. So a big data set, um, specifically only for the Shoshonitic condition, the Shoshonitic composition of the present day activity uh, at Stromboli. In the other case, I mean, for calculating the uh, time scale for Stromboli, in the previous paper, we used uh, some melts uh, modeling. And for Popo, we used the two uh, pyroxene, orthopyroxene, the two pyroxene from Putirka, 2008. I'm not I don't sure know if this, that was uh, where, where the question was heading to. Schumit, maybe you want to yeah. uh, ask the question yourself. No, so that answers it partly. So I was just wondering when you use melts on these individual zones, do you change the composition you put in or, or what do you do in the melts? Yes, absolutely. Yes, we change the composition. Uh, in system like uh, Stromboli or uh, um, when there are these two end members that are well known. So we definitely change the composition. For other system, it's more uh, complicated. First of all, you, you need to do your homework and try to find out what are the end member, or what this um, different composition actually related uh, to. Uh, at Popo, um, Martin Mangler has been doing really a lot of work looking at all the composition of uh, obtained for the different portion of the um, a pyroxene matching with the melt uh, and then trying to find the, the two end member. And also since we have the um, coexistence of orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene, then he was able to, to use the two pyroxene from uh, Putirka, which helped quite a lot in terms of uh, trying to equilibrate. But yes, I mean, changing the composition is fundamental. So, so how you get the composition is that described in that paper, the Manger paper, Manger et al. paper? Yes. Yeah. From, okay. from in Frontiers, yeah. 2020. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll yeah. Just okay. recently, like 
month ago or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Last question by Dan. We are a little bit behind schedule, but um, anyway. So, did you encounter any interesting textual challenges with your author pyroxenes? Some of the work uh, he has been involved with in silica uh, systems suggest that melt inclusions are very mobile along the c-axis, which can cause a lot of recrystallization, and annoyingly overrides diffusion. So did you encounter any textual challenges? Uh, not really, uh, not in this sense. I guess the main challenge was trying to constrain the temperature for the different portion, uh, not really in terms of texture. Um, so a, a bit of what? A bit of challenge in texture, uh, particularly for uh, Popo was the, due to the third, um, um, population, which I just glimpsed because was not really related to this talk, which seems like a mixing between the uh, two and member population. But in reality, what we found is, a, is the mafic uh, um, uh, population that has been diffused for very long time. So in that sense, uh, initially we thought it was just a mixing, but then uh, looking at the texture and looking at everything, it looked like uh, is the um, a population that record a very long storage time from the mafic portion that has been there for um, yeah, just diffusing. Okay, thanks again for the presentation and the, the answers.